Good evening to all. Tonight's class is dedicated in honor of the Upshernish of Nachi Becker and his parents, Shmuli and Shandy Becker, by David and Ida Schattenstein, Mazel Tov. So they tell the story of the person who runs into the office of the psychiatrist. Doctor, doctor, it's an emergency. You must help me right at this moment. And the doctor says, calm down, calm down. Doc, I can't calm down. It's an emergency situation. It's a matter of life and death. You must help me. The doctor says, listen, I can't help you when you're so anxious. Sit down on the couch and tell me everything from the beginning. Doctor, I can't sit down on no couch. I can't speak. You have to save my soul. I can't help you, the doctor says, if you do not relate to me everything from the beginning. Sit down, relax, and start from the beginning. And the man sits down and says, in the beginning, I created heaven and earth. So tonight, we want to go back to the beginning. Tonight, the festival and the holiday of Lagba Oimer, the 33rd day of the Oimer, one of the joyous and festive days in the Jewish calendar, is of course the day when we celebrate the life and the legacy of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yoichai, Rabbi Shimon, the son of Yoichai, whose yurtzeit, who passed away on the day of the 18th, on the 18th of year, the 33rd day of the Omer, known as Lagba Omer. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yoichai, who lived in the Holy Land under Roman occupation approximately in the year 165 after the Common Era, approximately one century after the destruction of the second Beis Hamikdash, the second temple in 70 after the Common Era, was an extraordinary Talmudic scholar, as well as the author of the Zohar, the most basic work of Kabbalah, of Jewish mysticism and spirituality. He was responsible for revealing to the world the wisdom of the Kabbalah and initiating a new era in the development and exposure of Jewish mysticism. The Zohar relates that before Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai passed away, he requested from his students and disciples that the day of his passing be celebrated as a, jay, as a day of festivity and joy. And thus Lagba Oimer, the 33rd day of the Oimer, has become in the Jewish tradition a day of tremendous joy, festivity, in Miron, the place where Rabbi Shimon is buried, hundreds of thousands of Jews gather each year in Lagba Oimer and dance away with unity and ecstasy during the 24 hours of Lagba Oimer. There are various Jewish customs and traditions that are associated with the day. One is a very unique one and an interesting one, namely, children go to the parks and to the fields to play with bows and arrows. They shoot arrows in parks and fields. This has become part of the tradition and ritual on the day of Lagba Omer. What is the reason for this custom? So in your curriculums in source number one under the video, there's a curriculum, a PDF, which you can open up or print out. The Bnei Yisoschar in Ma'amari Iyer in the section of Lagba Omer brings the reason based on what the Talmud tells us in Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud tractate brach is also in your curriculum. Reb Chizkiah b'shem Reb Yirmiyah. Rabbi Chizkiah said in the name of Rabbi Yirmiyah, kol yomov shal Reb Shimon ben Yechai, lo nira sa hakeshes ba'anon. All the days of Reb Shimon ben Yechai's life, there was no rainbow in the sky. Rashi in Parshas Noach also brings this tradition. You have it in your curriculum. Rashi says, There were generations that did not require the rainbow. Because they were complete tzaddikim, righteous people living in that gen those generations. As Genesis tells us in the portion of Noach in Bereshis, after the flood, which consumed the entire world in the days of Noah, 
God made a covenant with Noah and his children that he would not destroy the world again. And the symbol of the covenant was the keshes, the rainbow, that God tells Noah, if I even entertain the idea one day to destroy the world because of the tremendous evil in the universe, I will gaze at the rainbow in the sky and this will symbolize to me my oath and commitment never to destroy the world again. Comes Rashi and says there are generations that they didn't need the rainbow because the generation was filled with righteous people. The generation of Chizkiah, the king of Judea, and the generation of Reb Shimon by Yechai, whose yard site, whose day of passing is on Lag Boimer. In fact, in one of the liturgy, one of the piyutim, said traditionally Lag Boimer by many communities is the piyut known as Va'amartem Koy Lechai Rabbi Shimon by Yechai. And there's a line there. Kol yama v'asher chaya oisa keshes loiniya ki hu oisa lamaya adoy neinu bar yechai. All the days that he lived, there was no sign of a rainbow because he was, he was the eternal symbol, our master, the son of Yechai. In fact, there's an interesting idea quoted in a few of the sources, and you have it in your sources in the curriculum. There's a verse in Yecheskel in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1. Kemare hakeshes asheye ba'anon b'yoyim hagashem. As the symbol, the look, uh, the, the look of the rainbow, which will appear in the cloud on a rainy day. And this symbolizes the day of Lag Boimer, because the word, Biyoim Geshem, on a rainy day, is the same gematria, the same numerology as the two words Lag Boimer. That's the rainy day. Also, the words, Biyoim Shloisha Ushloisha, on the 33rd day, is the same gematria, the same numerology, like the words, Kemare. Asher yiyeh Symbolizing that on the 33rd day of the Omer, on Lag Boimer, we have the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds because till Reb Shimon Bar passed away, you didn't need a rainbow. His merit, his righteousness protected the world, justified the world. On Lag Boimer, he passed away. Now there was a need for a rainbow. In Hebrew, the word keshes, the same word keshes is used for the archer's bow, for the bow and arrow. It's also used for the rainbow in the sky, the half a circle. The bow the hunter uses, or the fighter uses, or the shooter uses, and the bow, the rainbow, they're both called bow, keshes. So, so the Bnei Yisoscher says, this is the origin of the custom that Jewish children and even adults, and there were some great tzaddikim, righteous people and masters, spiritual masters who would go out to the fields and the parks and like Boimer and shoot bow and ar- bows and arrows to commemorate the fact that this is the day the world once again needed the bow, the rainbow in the sky, because it's the day when Rabbi Shimon and Bayechai soul left this world and returned back to its maker, and thus the world was in need of a rainbow. And yet... This explanation leaves us wanting for two reasons. Number one, what is the real connection between playing with bows and arrows and the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day? Just because they share the same word, bow, or the word in Hebrew, keshes, does that really create a connection between them? You're shooting bows and arrows, you're shooting arrows on like Bohemer. Why? Because when Rav Shimon passed away, there was, they needed a rainbow in the sky. It seems like a very far-fetched explanation. The second challenge, the second problem is, this symbol is a completely negative symbol. Like Baomer is a day of joy commemorating the life, the holiness, the legacy of Reb Shemar Bayechai. How do we celebrate the day? By going out to the fields and playing with bows and arrows, shooting arrows, commemorating a negative symbol that because Rabbi Shimon passed away, now we will need a rainbow because we don't have him any longer. Why would they institute a custom which represents the sadness, the melancholy, the negativity over the fact that Rabbi Shimon Bayechai is not here when the entire day focuses on the joy of the life, the contribution, the legacy, and the energy which Rabbi Shimon Bayechai gave and left the Jewish people and the world. So tonight we will explore another perspective on this custom 
of children going to the parks and fields to play with bows and arrows, on Lagba Omer, from a deeper, more mystical and spiritual perspective. And let's introduce it with an interesting statement by the Zohar. Again, you have it in your curriculum. The Zohar in the portion of Noach says, do not wait for the feet of Mashiach until a rainbow does not appear in the world, colored with diverse colors which brightens up the world. Apparently, this is a difficult Zohar to understand. When you read the Chumash, you read the Torah, it's clear that the rainbow is a negative symbol. It represents the fact that God may entertain the thought of destroying the world. And because of the rainbow, he remembers that he made an oath that despite my initial thought, I am committed to leave the world alone. And yet in the Zohar, we see the rainbow as a very positive symbol. Don't wait for Mashiach till you see the rainbow, which means the rainbow in a way, heralds the idea of the redemption. A very positive and powerful symbol. It's the preparation for the redemption of the world. In order to understand this, let us go back to the one biblical story, an enigmatic and deeply moving and tragic story. In the book of Shmuel 1, Samuel 1, the story of David and Yonason, David and Yonason, David and Jonathan, Yonason being the son of King Saul, Shaul HaMelech, a story connected with bows and arrows, and thus an appropriate story for Lagboimer. If you take a look in your sources, Shmuel Aleph, Samuel 1, chapter 20, Perikhov, Posik Yud Ches. This is, of course, the story of a covenant of love and loyalty crafted between two unlikely figures, David HaMelech, who was being hunted down and persecuted by Shoal, by the king, who felt that David is threatening his royalty and kingship as discussed in the Tanakh. And Yonason, who is the son and the natural ear of Shoal, who loves David with all of his heart and all of his soul. The unforgettable eulogy and the words of David after Yonason is killed in war with his father, those, that eulogy in the book of Shmuel, one of the most powerful, moving eulogies given in the history of humanity, how David laments the death of his brother, of his best friend, Yonis. And so, David is trying to explain to Yonis that his father wants to kill him. His father sees him as a persona non grata. He wants to eliminate him from the earth. And Yonis cannot believe that's the truth, that his father, Shoal, the king of the Jewish people, wants to destroy, wants to kill David HaMelech. And so, Vayoymer lo Yonison, Yehoynison, Jonathan tells David, Machar Chaydish, tomorrow is the beginning of the month, v'nifkadeta, you'll be remembered, ki yipokeid meishavecha, because your seat will be absent. David would not come to the feast of Shaul HaMelech, you will be remembered because your seat will be absent. A very powerful verse. We remember people when they're absent. When their seat is filled with them, we don't remember them. But when you're not there, we remember. Vishilashta on the third day, verse 29. You'll go down. You'll go to the same place where you once hid on an earlier day. And you'll sit near a stone called Ozel. I will shoot three arrows to the side of the rock. As a tar- with, on a target. I will face, I will shoot three arrows towards a target on the side of the stone. And I'll send my lad. I'll send a lad. Go find the arrows which I, which I shot. If I tell the lad, you went too far, come back. The arrows are closer to me than kachenu vavoya. Then you, David, you can come out of your hiding place, take the arrows and come back. Kishalom lecha, it's peace to you, v'yein davar, and there's nothing going on. Chay Hashem, may God live. I swear it's all peaceful. V'yim kai oimar la'elam, but if I tell the lad, hinei achitzim imcha v'hala, 
the arrows are further down. You didn't go far enough, go further. Leich, then David, it means you must go. Kishil, shilachecha Hashem, because God has sent you. So Yoinison gives David a sign, how he will communicate to him discreetly the message of whether his father, the king Saul, is out to get him or his father has made peace with him. He doesn't want to verbalize it clearly. It must be a secret. No one could know where David is because of the danger. David is going to hide in the forest at a particular place near a stone called Uzzel. Yonason is going to shoot three arrows. He's going to have his lad there. He's going to send his lad to go bring back the arrows. His lad is going to go running. He sees where the arrows landed. So he goes running to get them. But usually you don't know exactly where the arrows have landed. If David says, come back, you went too far. The arrows are closer. It means that David can also come back. If he tells the lad, go further. The arrows are further. You must go further away from me. It means that David must go further away. It means that there is no peace, that David's life is in danger and jeopardy. And so, as you have in your curriculum, we skip to uh, verse 35. This is what happens. It's in the morning, and Yonason goes out to the field where David is hiding. He has a young lad. He shoots the arrows. He tells the lad, go find the arrows. The lad goes and runs to find the arrows and bring them back to his master, to Yonason. And as the Pasuk says in Lamed Zayin, anar ad The lad comes to the place. We are Yonason shot the arrow. Vayoymer, vayikri Yonason achri anar. Jonathan calls the lad Vayoymer and he says, Aloya chetzi mimcha vahala. The arrow is further down. And the lad takes the arrows and Yonason sends him home with the arrows and he knows nothing. In verse 41, Hanar Ba, the lad left. David comes, he is now privately with Yonason. Nobody's there. Falls down on his face, bows down three times. They kiss each other. They cry. The two friends weep with each other. Ad David Higdil. Till it reaches the point where David is weeping far more than Yonason. And Yonason tells David, Lech Shalom, go to peace. Our covenant between ourselves and the name of God, between you and me, between our children, will be timeless and eternal. And this meant, of course, that David had to be on the run. And the continuation of the story in the Tanakh is how David, for a very, very long time, is on the run. Running from the king of Israel, from the Kshol HaMelech. At some points, it's very, very close, but at the end, David HaMelech is saved. And the great tragedy and drama of the relationship, the difficult relationship between Shaul and David HaMelech only intensifies from this point on throughout the continuation of the story until many years later when Shaul HaMelech will die and ultimately David will succeed him as the king of the Jewish people. The obvious question is, what's the story of the arrows? Why the arrows? Why go through this whole hassle? I'm sure Yonason and David could have come up with some type of code language in which Yonason could communicate the message whether he's safe or he's unsafe. Did he really have to go through this whole dramatic procedure of shooting three arrows and bringing a land and sending the land and telling him the arrows are closer, the arrows are further? <laughs> There's no other simpler way of communicating a secret message. In the works of Hasidism of Hasidus, the following explanation is developed. Yaakov Avinu, our father Jacob, speaks to his son Joseph, Yosef, and Parshas Vayichi, when he's on his deathbed and he speaks to his sons and he tells Yosef, and you have it in your source, I am giving you the city of Shechem. In addition to the gifts your brothers are getting, I'm giving you the city of Nablus of Shechem. Asher lakachti miyada emoidi b'chayr b'yu b'kashti. Which I have taken from the Emorite tribe, 
becharbi through my sword, u bekashti through my bow and arrow, through my archer's bow. Archer's bow. So Yaakov discusses here two weapons: charbi my sword and kashti my bow. What is the significance of these two weapons? Comes Rabbi Shnei Zalman of Liadi the Alter Rebbe, the author of the Tanya and Shulchan Aruch, and in his work Torah Er, in the Hisafis, the Parshas Vayechi explains that the first weapons devised by man were designed for hand-to-hand combat: the sword, the spear, the axe, the, and the like, and the like. But a person's enemy or prey is not always at arm's length or even within sight. Sometimes your prey or your enemy is invisible. Sometimes your enemy is not right there in front of you. The sword will be ineffective. So soon the warrior and the hunter were inventing an array of weapons capable of reaching targets that are a great distance away or that even lie invisible and are protected behind barriers of every sort. Chief among these new weapons was the bow and arrow, invented early on in human history. Even in Chumash, we have the bow as a weapon. Isaac discusses it. Yaakov discusses it. And for many centuries, for many cultures, the bow and arrow served as the main weapon for a very long time. One of the principles of Kabbalah and Chassidus is every physical reality and phenomenon originates in a metaphysical reality, in a spiritual phenomenon. This is also true concerning the sword and the bow, the two weapons. There are two types of enemies. There are exposed enemies and there are concealed enemies. There are conspicuous foes, they require a sword or other weapons devised for hand-to-hand combat. But then there are foes or prey which are distant from the person or sometimes invisible. Here, the sword will not do the trick. Charbi will not suffice. Here you need kashti. Here you need the bow and the arrow. The man who invented this device of the bow and arrow had to grasp a very important paradox. And this is what the Alter Rebbe brings out, this particular dimension concerning the bow. The paradox was, in order for the deadly arrow to strike, it first must be pulled back towards one's own heart in order to strike at the heart of the enemy. And the more one draws the bow towards oneself, the more distant a foe it can reach. So the more I draw it closer to my heart, closer to myself, the further it can travel, the more distant an enemy it can reach. What does this represent psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually? There are enemies, there are challenges that are obvious. They're in front of our eyes. They're conspicuous. They're manifested. These are the obvious foes. But then there are enemies that are distant, much more subtle, much more nebulous, much less defined much more abstract, sometimes completely invisible subconscious. You can't identify them clearly. These enemies are not any less dangerous sometimes because they are subtle. They undermine, they eat up on the person from within in discreet and secretive and mischievous ways. One can't even identify them, articulate them, and one can't fight them with the sword. Here one needs bekashti. Here you need your arrow. Let's discuss it within the context of Jewish ethics, of Jewish life, of Jewish spirituality. 
There are enemies that are very obvious. There are the evils that the Torah articulates. Sins, transgressions, immoral, unethical, disgusting, repulsive behavior. Acts like stealing, like murder, like abuse, like insulting somebody, like cheating, like lying, like deceiving. And other prohibitions discussed in the Torah, these are the obvious enemies, the obvious challenges, negative inclinations, appetites, instincts, addictions, cravings that a human being struggles with and against and must take his or her sword to fight them. Hand-to-hand combat with the enemy right in, right in front of you. But then there are the subtle issues, issues that have to do with your inner heart, with your inner personality. Questions of motivation. Sometimes you're doing great stuff. You're doing, accomplishing great things, but what is your motivation? Issues like love, awe. Issues of ego, arrogance. Guilt, insecurity, shame, inner selfishness. Sometimes negative qualities that at the surface you can't identify them. A person may be following the code of Jewish law, the ethical standards of Torah par excellence. When he or she looks at themselves in the mirror or others look at them, psh, They tell the story of, of a Jew, a Hasidic Jew who was, ah, he was poor, he was poverty stricken, and he was walking to his Rebbe. And on the way, he sees a Jew in a wagon, an aristocrat, and the Jew, the aristocrat, turns to him and says, where you going? I'm going to my Rebbe. He says, oh, I'm going the same way to the same city. Come on, my coach, and I'll give you a ride. He sits down near this aristocrat. The aristocrat says, where are you going? What's your name? Shalom Aleichem. What's my name? What do you do? And the aristocrat says, I'm a doctor. And he starts telling this Hasidic Jew, he says, you know, I am a physician. And I heal many, many, many people. Very many sick people come through my door and I help them out. And the Hasidic Jew tells him, he says, Ich tu I also do that. And he said, I want you to know if somebody doesn't have money, I treat them for no money, for free. And the man says, Ich tu I also do that. And the aristocrat, the wealthy man says, and I want you to know that if somebody needs money, I also lend money to people, interest free. Free interest loans. And this Jew says, Ich tu I also do that. So finally he turns to him and he says, I'll tell you other things I do. And he starts telling him the amounts of charity he gives. Ich tu I also do that. He says, Was tust tu You're not a physician. You look like a schlepper. You're a poverty stricken individual. What do you mean, Ich tu I He says, I do the same thing like you. I only talk about the good things. I only talk about the positive things. I tell you how great, I also say how great I am. Sometimes we look at ourselves in the mirror, we look at somebody in the mirror from an external behavior on the surface. It looks perfect. He follows all of the mitzvahs. He studies Torah. But the person is not just an external machine. There's an inner soul, there's an inner consciousness. What's happening inside of me? Am I refined? Have I really penetrated my ego and discovered my soul? Am I really capable of transcendence? Do I know what it means to go out of myself and be there for another person? Do I know what it means to really touch the divine? Is there an element of truth and idealism in me? These are what's called chayvas halavavas, the duties of the heart beneath the surface. Here a sword will not do the trick, here I need a bow. What's the idea of the bow? The closer you bring it to your heart, you have to first pull it back towards your heart in order to strike at the heart of the distant enemy. The more you draw it towards yourself, the more distant a foe it can reach. The bow means I go deep into myself. I must excavate my ego. I must take the shovel and the hoe and dig and drill through the layers of guilt and shame and fear to go deep into my soul to discover the essence of the human soul, of the human neshama, which as the Tanya puts it, is a chelik elikami mal, a fragment, a spark of the divine. And the deeper I go into my essence, to my core, 
the further I can reach to defeat those subtle enemies, those subtle issues which are inconspicuous, which are not manifested sometimes on the surface, but which often play a very powerful role in a human life and develop and, and play themselves out in different ways, sometimes indirectly. Judaism, the body of Judaism has two dimensions. Bekashti. There is the sword of Judaism and there is the bow, the archer's bow of Judaism. This is known as Nigla and Nister. The revealed dimension of Judaism and the esoteric. Or in other words, Halacha and Kabbalah. Halacha, the literature of Jewish law including Talmud, including all of the works of Jewish law and ethics throughout the generations, they are the sword of Judaism. They define what is the divine perspective, how to distinguish between good and evil, between positive and negative, between light and darkness, between the permissible and the forbidden. When it comes to issue of Kashrus, when it comes to issues of Shabbos, when it comes to issue of Ben Adam Lachaveri, of civil relationships between people, between neighbors, between partners, between parents and children, between nations. The same as the obligations between the human being and God. Whether it's the laws of Pesach or the laws of Sukkot, the laws of Chametz or the laws of Erevin, the laws of Mezuzah, the laws of Mikveh, the laws of Tzitzis or the laws of study. This is the sword which takes on the hand which takes on the enemy which is right in front of you, challenging the appetites and the desires for a person to often engage in the prohibited, in the repulsive, in the wrong behavior and challenge it. It distinguishes and defines, it defines who the enemy is and how we combat it. Then there is the literature of Kabbalah. Jewish mysticism, spirituality, including all of the writings of Kabbalah and subsequently the writings of Hasidism based on the Kabbalah. This literature deals not so much with the open enemy, it deals much more with the inner dynamics of the human being, the science of the soul, of the human soul and of the cosmic soul and helps the person like the arrow pull back into himself or herself and explore the underlying energies of the human identity, of the human psyche. And thus allows us to deal with the subtle enemies and defeat them as well. This is true not only horizontal, horizontally it's also true vertically. The lower you pull down the arrow, the higher it will reach. This also represents a spiritual truth. In life, often, a person must go down very low. This is what Kabbalah and Hasidus call avoidas habirurim, the work of extracting the sparks in the dregs, in the filth of reality. Sometimes you're lucky and fortunate to deal only with light, with brightness, with luminescence. But sometimes the bow must be pulled down very, very low. The person must engage very deep, dark layers in his or her psyche and animal soul. I have to confront the darkness of the world. When I look at the world, when I look at myself, it's often opaque. It's not transparent. It conceals completely the reality of godliness. And this is the objective of creation that the human being, that the Jew comes and confronts. The opaqueness of reality and existence penetrates and goes into the lowest and darkest places, pulling the bow downwards. And yet, the lower you pull it, the higher it will reach. Because the story of life as Judaism and as Kabbalah articulates so powerfully is that the lower we go down, the more we are ready to confront the opaque and crass elements of our own existence and the existence of the world, we reach the highest places in the reality of God, in the reality of truth. This explains to us the deeper symbolism behind the story of David and Yonason, of David and Jonathan. The king at the time was Shaul. 
The job of every leader of every king is to heal the world, to heal the Jewish people and heal the world. L'sakin oilam b'malchus shin dalad yud, as we say in the Aleinu prayer, to fix the world and reveal in it the presence and the sovereignty of God. Or in other words, to complete the birurim, to sublimate the universe, to realign the world with its creator with its true spiritual purpose, to penetrate through the layers of opaqueness, the klipa, the shell, the husk, that conceal the truth of spirituality and godliness in the core of the person and in the core of the world. At the surface, the world says, I am here and there's nothing else. I am a selfish, narcissistic entity. Our challenge is to go deeper and reveal the fine godliness vibrating through the cosmos. And thus the great question confronting David and Jonathan at that day is, what is happening with the arrows? The reason why he shoots the three arrows is not just a random way of communicating a message. It presents a deeply philosophical idea. The arrows represent the general work of confronting the darkness of the world and sublimating it, challenging it, subduing it, and often transforming it. This is what the arrow represents. The lower you go down, the higher you will reach. Birurim is the need to go down sometimes very, very low. A person can say, I only want to deal with holiness. When I'm dealing with myself, I'm often dealing with unholiness, with questions, with dilemmas. In the roller coaster of life, we don't have the luxury of only being on the top all of the time. A person who serves God, a person who works on himself or herself must have the courage to confront darkness every day of his life. This is the idea of the arrow. You must go down very low, but the lower you go, don't fall into despair. Don't give up. The higher you will reach. So this is the question. What is happening in this process of Birurim? Where is the world holding? So Yoinison says, if I tell the child, the arrows are closer, you can come back. Child, come back. The arrows are not so far. It means that the avoidus habirurim, the work of sublimating the world represented by the arrows has been completed. Who is the master of this? Who understands this most? The king, Shoal HaMelech. Because it's the king's responsibility to heal the world. Shoal is going to be able to determine whether the work of the birurim has been completed. And Shoal could be now the king which will lead the Jewish world and the world to redemption. Or, if the arrows are further away, it means the work of Birurim has not been finished. And now, David HaMelech has to embark on his journey. This is what Jonathan tells David. If you look in the verses again in your curriculum, chapter 20, verse 21, he says, If I tell you the arrows are closer, come back and bring the arrows. Kishalem lecha. It's peace. Ve'ein davar. There's nothing else that we need. Chay Hashem. It's not just an oath. God can live. The presence of God can be revealed in the world. But if I tell the child, Ha'chitzimim chavaholo, the arrows are further. David HaMelech Leich, you must go. You must begin your travel into the valley of tears. You must begin your journey to trailblaze through pathways of darkness. You must begin your trek through wilderness and through chaos, geographically and psychologically, because the arrows are still ahead. Don't be scared of it. Because God has sent you. The lower you go down, the lower you pull the arrow, the higher you can reach. God is with you on this journey of confronting the world and transforming it. Shoal is the king. He determines. He knows. He will tell us, ultimately, if the arrows are closer to us, and then you can come back to it. Or, the arrows are ahead of us. There's still a lot of work to be done. And you need to go on your own journey. You have to go far away. You can't be near the king. You must run from place to place 
which is what David HaMelech does, all representing the idea of Birurim, going through difficult terrains, difficult challenges, and dealing with these elements of life and with these elements in the human psyche, spiritually as well. David HaMelech is defined as the person, if you look in your curriculum, the Gemara says in Avay Dezara, tracted Avay Dezara, page 5, um, the Reb Shmuel bar Nachmeni, um, Reb Yonis, Reb Shmuel, the son of Nachmeni, said in the name of Reb Yonis, and my dixiv noum David ben Yishai, noum agever hu kamoil. What does the verse mean? These are the words of David, the son of Yishai. These are the words of the person who hu kamoil, who created the yoke, noum David ben Yishai, shehekim oila shel tshuva. David Amelech erected, David created oila shel tshuva. The yoke of tshuva, of repentance, referring to the story that will occur between David and Bathsheba. David HaMelech Hakim Oila Shal Tshuva, the yoke of tshuva, this represents the ultimate birurim. The challenge and the ability to be able to go down into a place of darkness and yet come up. Use it as a springboard and a catalyst for rejuvenation, for growth. And this means there is no peace between Shaul and David because the Birurim will not be finished in the time of Shaul. David can't just come back. The Birurim will still need to be continued and therefore there has to be a new king and a new process and a new journey. It will begin with David HaMelech who will be the father of the Davidic dynasty which will culminate with the king of Mashiach who comes from the house of David. This is the symbol of the arrows in the Tanakh. We discussed the bow of the archer. Now let's go back to the rainbow. What is a rainbow? What is a rainbow? Rays of sunlight passed through water droplets suspended in the atmosphere. And the clear crystal-like droplets refract the light, unleashing the spectrum of colors it contains and displaying them in an arc across the misty skies. So there are clouds or raindrops which catch the light of the sun and they channel the rays which they capture in such a way which reveals the many colors implicit within each ray of sunlight and thus we have the beautiful rainbow. What does this represent on a spiritual level? Why is this chosen by God as the covenant not to bring the flood again? We talk about the light, the light of the sun, and we talk about the clouds. The clouds which eclipse the light of the sun. What the rainbow represents is that there are moments in history when the clouds themselves can refract and catch the rays of the light and display the colors implicit in these rays in a new, beautiful, diverse, bright, and beautiful way. So sometimes we say, the sun is shining, oh, beautiful. Sometimes the sun is not shining, the clouds eclipse the rays of the sun, there's darkness. But we know that above the clouds, there's sunlight. Above the clouds, there's hope, there's optimism. But then there's something called a rainbow. The rainbow is that the clouds themselves, at some point, reflect the light of the sun. The darkness itself becomes a vehicle for light. This then is the rainbow. God looks at the world, it seems like a crazy, chaotic, horrible place. I want to destroy it, but I remember the rainbow. The rainbow tells me that as a result of the flood, the world on its own has a potential for rejuvenation, for tshuva, for repentance, for healing. It's not hopeless. In the clouds, there is potential for light, not above the clouds, but from the clouds, within the clouds, reflecting the sun. And therefore, the same rainbow representing the symbol of the flood and not destroying the world is the rainbow. The Zohar says, when you see the rainbow, know that you can wait for the feet of Mashiach because the work of Birurim, of sublimating the world, of revealing the light in the clouds, has been completed. Now we're ready for Mashiach to come. So when Yonason, when Jonathan tells David, I'm going to go out to the field and I'm going to shoot three arrows, verse 20, 
I'm going to shoot three arrows. The Arizal writes in Lakuti Torah in his commentary on this, ver- on this verse in Samuel 1, chapter 20. Why three? Representing the three basic colors of the rainbow. I will shoot three bows, three arrows from the bow and arrow. Shloishachitz representing three colors of the rainbow. What's the connection? These are arrows, this is a rainbow, because they both represent the work of sublimating the darkness, of revealing the sun, of the light, the light of the sun in the clouds, just as the arrow represents going downwards and unleashing a force which reaches the greatest heights, the ultimate objective of all of existence, to transform the darkness of the world into an abode for God. Keshes and Keshes, the archer's bow and the rainbow. They both have the same word, Keshes. It's not a random error. There is the rainbow that appears on the, in the clouds on the rainy day, and there is the ancient weapon we call the bow. The common denominator is a half a circle. How do you say a circle in Hebrew? Galgal. The Keshes, the bow, the rainbow is a half a circle. It's half of Galgal. What's half of Galgal? Gal. Galgal, Gimel Lamed, Gimel Lamed is 66. What's half of Galgal? Gal. What's Gal? 33. Gimel Lamed. Representing Lag. Gal einai v'abitin eflois meteresach, the verse says in Tehillim. Expose my eyes and I will see wonders of the Torah. Because here we understand what is Kabbalah. What is Kabbalah? What is Jewish mysticism? What is this wisdom we call Kabbalah? In recent years, Kabbalah has become a popular phenomenon. Sometimes the people who speak most about Kabbalah know very little about Kabbalah. Some famous people have become Kabbalists, but they barely know anything about Kabbalah. The old Kabbalists used to say, those who know don't say, and those who say don't know. Or as somebody once said, today people are reading more and more about less and less, and you could say the same about Kabbalah. What is really the soul of Kabbalah? What is the journey of Kabbalah? Kabbalah in one word is Bekashti. It's the bow. It's the archer's bow, and it's the rainbow. Lagba Imer, the day when Reb Shimon Yechai passes away, he revealed Kabbalah to the world as the day of Gal. The half a circle, the half a galga. Galen, I open my eyes and let me see wonders of your Torah. Wonders of your Torah. Which wonders? The wonders of the bow. The contribution of Kabbalah was that it revealed to the world the rainbow and the clouds. As history was evolving, it's very easy to come and look at the world and see it as a place that's devoid of purpose, that's devoid of meaning, that's devoid of dignity. So much suffering, so much horror, so much abuse, so much despair. Who more than the Jewish people endured savage suffering in this world? And what the literature of Kabbalah gave the Jewish people was a new perspective on the world. To be able to see the soul underneath the cosmos. To be able to see the deeper journey of history. To be able to see the sparks inherent within every phenomenon, experience, reality, and existence. To be able to appreciate the evolution of history from a spiritual perspective. In Kabbalah there is nothing random. No event, no human being. No historical event, everything has purpose, meaning. And this is discussed in the literature of Kabbalah at length. In one word, it explored the rainbow. It didn't only say there is a light above the clouds. It allowed us to look at the clouds and allow the clouds themselves to refract and display the light of the sun in its own unique, beautiful way. Kabbalah also allowed the person and the Jew to pull back, to go deeply into his or her own heart and explore his or her own soul, 
spiritual identity. Understand the inner music of what it means to be human, what it means to be Jewish, and then it allows you to go and reach those subtle enemies. To be able to work on the underlying motivations and elements within our own character, within our own psyche, within our own relationships, with ourselves, with other people, with the world, and with God. So on Lagba Eimer, children and the child within each of us goes out to the field. We go out to the field and we play with what? With bows and arrows. Because Reb Shimon Bar Yechai gave the world a bow. He gave the Jewish people in the world a bow. He gave us the ability through Kabbalah to go into the depth of our souls and to expose the essence of the clouds of the universe. This is why Lag Boimer is such a joyous day. This is why in Miran tonight and throughout Lag Boimer, hundreds of thousands of Jews will dance in Miran and around the world because it's the beginning of the revelation of the light in the clouds, the revelation of Mashiach in the clouds. Let me conclude with this story. I heard the story from a senior colleague rabbi, Rabbi Zalman Posner Zosein Gesund from Nashville, Tennessee, shared with me that many years ago in the late 40s, he was offered a rabbinate position in a community in the United States, which at the time was, spiritually speaking, a barren desert as far as Judaism is concerned. No kosher food, no Jewish infrastructure, no Jewish education. And he declined the offer. He did not want to go take the position in the shul. And he was standing at a private audience, in a private audience with the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson, who passed away in 1950. And he shared with the Rebbe his resistance to go and accept his, to accept his job and go to this far of community, foreign community. America of 19, the late 1940s is not the United States of America of 2009. And he shared this with me. He said, the Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson, looked at him and said the following words. The soul, before it's born, it does not want to come down to the world. Why? Because the neshama, the soul, finds itself in a warm, cozy, and bright, luminescent environment. And it doesn't want to go down to a world which is cold and dark. If you're in a place that is warm and bright, why do you want to go down to a place which is cold and finster, cold and dark? The soul refuses to go on the journey. The soul doesn't want to go down. And God tells the soul, Nay, nay, no, no. You have to go down. Now the Rebbe in his later years was very ill. He was paralyzed. It was hard for him to talk. And hard for him to move his body. And when he would make a gesture with his body, it was extremely difficult. And sometimes he would do it to demonstrate his point. And he said the Rebbe lifted up his hand, his holy hand. When Hashem is speaking to the soul and says, No, no, you can't stay here. You, gotta go down. you have to go down. And he lowered, he lowered his whole hand. You have to go down. Vusakalton Finster, to a place which is cold and dark. Undorten machen lichtig und warm. And there you have to create light and warmth. The challenge is not to remain in a place which is light and warm. Go to a place which is cult and finster, it's dark, cold. And there you will create and generate warmth and light. Needless to say, Rabbi Posner embarked on the journey, representing the journey of every soul in this world, and ultimately transformed the community in many ways. This is the journey of the bow. The more you pull down, the higher you reach. It's confronting the opaqueness of the human being in the world and transforming it. This is the journey of Reb Shimon by Yechai to be able to reveal the, lights with, the light within the cloud. This is the connection of the two kashases. This is the connection of the simple reason why we play with the bow and arrow. 
the day Reb Shimon Bar Yechai passed away, and the deeper connection because he gave the world the bow. He represented the rainbow when he was alive. You didn't need a physical rainbow. When he passed away, we sometimes need a physical rainbow. But what's inherent in the physical rainbow is the message that every situation, even sometimes the darkest situations, give us the opportunity for rejuvenation and for a new and deeper light. Have a good evening and a happy, very happy and joyous Lagba Omer.